In a war defined by innovation, desperation, and overwhelming firepower, one tank stood above the rest, literally and figuratively. Its silhouette struck fear into Allied crews. Its armor turned entire barrages into sparks and dust. Its gun could destroy enemy armor before they even came into firing range. This was the King Tiger, Germany's last great gamble to dominate the battlefield. But for all its firepower, precision, and presence, it couldn't change the outcome of the war. Today, we explore how one of the most feared tanks in history became a mechanical marvel and a logistical tragedy. In the early years of World War II, German tanks like the Panzer IV and the Tiger I dominated battlefields with speed and firepower. But by 1943, things had changed. The Allies were adapting. The Soviets were rolling out T-34s by the thousands, and in North Africa, Shermans arrived in droves. The Tiger I had shocked the battlefield, but it was no longer untouchable, so Hitler demanded something new, something stronger, a war machine that would remind the world who led in armored warfare. The answer, a tank so large, so powerful, so heavily armed, that it broke the very limits of what a battlefield vehicle could be. The Tiger II, known to history as the King Tiger, was not built for mobility. It was built to conquer. At a staggering 154,000 pounds, it was nearly 30,000 pounds heavier than the Tiger I, longer than a bus, taller than a truck, wider than some modern-day streets. It had five crew members, driver and radio operator in the hull, gunner and loader in the turret, and the commander, perched at the top, scanning the battlefield through a full ring of periscopes. The armor? Near impenetrable from the front. The upper glacis plate was 150 millimeters thick, sloped at 50 degrees, giving it an effective thickness of over 8 inches. Not a single known combat incident saw this front plate breached. Its turret was similarly formidable, up to 180 millimeters thick at the front. Even its weakest sides were stronger than the front armor of many Allied tanks. This wasn't a tank. It was a fortress on tracks. Then there was the main gun. The King Tiger carried the 88 millimeter KWK-43 L-71, a weapon so powerful that it could destroy any Allied tank before those tanks could even return fire. It was longer, more precise, and significantly more powerful than the 88 millimeter gun used in the Tiger I. The muzzle velocity? Over 1,100 meters per second with specialized ammunition. In battlefield trials, it achieved 100% hit probability at 1,000 meters. Even at 3,500 meters, the accuracy was around 50 cent, unheard of at the time. Two main armor-piercing shells were used. The Panzer Grenade 3943, designed to defeat sloped armor with a dual-cap construction and explosive core, and the Panzer Grenade 4043, a tungsten cord shell capable of punching through nearly 10 inches of steel, but rarely used due to tungsten shortages. The gun was fed manually, with the loader racing to keep up. A skilled loader could fire a shell every eight seconds under ideal conditions, but every round was massive and space was limited. From the outside, the King Tiger looked unstoppable. Inside, it was a symphony of over-engineering. The gun recoil system used dual hydraulic and hydropneumatic cylinders to absorb force. Compressed air aided elevation. A rotating turret powered by the main engine could spin 360 degrees in 19 seconds under ideal conditions. The gunner's sights used a dual magnification telescopic system marked in milliradians for precision range estimation. It worked if the gunner had the time. Machine guns were mounted in the hull and turret. 
There was even a grenade launcher for repelling close infantry attacks. But for all its innovation, the King Tiger had one enemy it couldn't defeat. Itself. The Maybach HL230 P30 engine delivered 700 horsepower, which sounds impressive, until you consider it had to move 70 tons. On paper, the tank could hit 25 miles per hour. In practice, 15 to 20 miles per hour was more realistic, and even that strained the drivetrain. Its Alvar OG 4012-16B transmission, final drives, and suspension were all holdovers from earlier, lighter tanks. They weren't built for this much weight, and they failed, often. In fact, the final drive assembly, the system that transferred engine power to the tracks, became infamous for its fragility. Its average lifespan? Just 300 kilometers. Breakdowns were so common that entire King Tiger battalions would lose more tanks to mechanical failure than to enemy fire. The King Tiger was also cursed with terrible logistics timing. By late 1944, Germany was running out of fuel. The Allies bombed supply lines. Soviet forces cut off rail access. And the King Tiger? It drank fuel like no other tank on the field. Its seven fuel tanks held 227 gallons, giving it a range of about 100 miles on roads, and far less in combat conditions. That meant every kilometer it moved came at an enormous cost. Fuel leaks were common. Fires happened. Maintenance took hours. Recovery, if the tank broke down, often meant towing by another King Tiger or abandoning it entirely. Despite all this, when the King Tiger actually made it to the front, it was lethal. In Belgium, one Tiger II knocked out an American Sherman from 2,000 meters away. First shot, total kill. On the Eastern Front, it inspired dread in Soviet tank crews who often refused to engage unless they had overwhelming numbers. And in Normandy, a single Tiger II could stall an entire Allied column if positioned well. But the flip side was this. For every one tiger that made it into action, many more never got there. They broke down on the way, ran out of fuel, got stuck in mud, or were destroyed from the air while being towed. Even when they did fight, their slow traverse, limited visibility, and heavy weight meant that ambushes or flanking maneuvers could take them out. The real problem wasn't the King Tiger itself. It was what the war had become. By 1944, Germany needed fast, mobile units. It needed tanks that were easy to repair, cheap to build, and quick to deploy. The King Tiger was none of those things. It cost twice as much as a Panther, took far longer to build, and required a logistical tail Germany simply didn't have anymore. As one German commander put it, the race between armor and anti-tank gun has been decided in favor of the gun. Only 489 King Tigers were built. By the time they arrived, the war was already turning against Germany on every front. They became mobile bunkers, rear guard weapons, desperate attempts to hold ground that was already lost. They terrified Allied tankers, but couldn't stop Allied armies. One veteran from the 503rd Heavy Tank Battalion said it best, one hour of Tiger operation requires 10 hours of maintenance. And in a war of attrition, that's a losing equation. The King Tiger was, without question, one of the most powerful tanks ever built. It was a mechanical marvel, a battlefield titan, a symbol of overreach. But in the end, it showed us a deeper truth about warfare. You can build the best weapon in the world, but it means nothing without the infrastructure to support it. Power doesn't win wars. Speed does. Simplicity does. Numbers do. And no tank, 
no matter how mighty, can stop a war that's already lost. The King Tiger might have been too heavy for its time, but its story still carries weight today. If you found this story fascinating, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. I am diving deep into the extreme engineering, bold experiments, and the legends behind them that defined World War II. And I am just getting started uncovering these forgotten pieces of history that shaped our modern world.